Uh, so why immunotherapy? I think uh, for, for decades the issues have been pretty apparent. One is, uh, particularly for T cells, is specificity. I think everybody knows that T cells recognize peptides in the context of MHC molecules. Uh, they're displayed to let the body know what, what's going on in the cells. Um, and we know now increasingly that, that uh, in cancer, the, the immune system seems to be focused on neoantigens generated by mutations, not just the driver mutations, which is what uh, precision medicine has been about, but also all the, many of the passenger mutations, if they re meet certain minimum qualities, they can be presented uh, to the immune system. And second is memory. Once you've got T cells, you've got them for the rest of your life. And they can be reawakened if the cancer reoccurs and, and attack it again, unlike any other drug. And finally, there's adaptability. You probably have about 100 million T cells with different set receptors going around the body. And I would argue, and it can change with time, and I would argue that that's, that's a match for the, for the genomic instability and mutability and, and, and evolution the, the, of tumors that, that plagues more conventional types of cancer therapy. And so just to show you where, you where we are, in 2011, the drug I helped develop, ipilimumab with Metarex, was approved for, mel for uh, melanoma. In 2014, there were two PD-1 drugs, another checkpoint that I'll talk about, also for melanoma. In 2015, there was an avalanche of approvals in lung, adjuvant melanoma, renal carcinoma. And then last year, there were approvals of Hodgkin's lymphoma, bladder, head and neck, and non-small cell lung cancer. So you can see that this, this field is growing. At a, at a really geometric rate and is uh, being used now in, in many different types of cancer. And we're beginning to understand the rules of it, and I'll get to that uh, later for, for some of the cancers that don't respond. Uh, what is this? Well, it's kind of a strange cancer therapy because it doesn't involve the cancer cells at all. We ignore the cancer cells. We don't sequence it or try to find drugs that inhibit an enzymes or anything like that. It doesn't involve, at the present point at least, using vaccines uh, to, or to target the immune system or cytokines to turn them on. What it involves is it works by just removing inhibitory circuits to unleash the immune system to do what it was doing anyway. So people say well, we've learned how to harness the immune system uh, to attack cancer. Well, that's true of some types of immunotherapy, but not checkpoint blockade. Checkpoint blockade is merely unleashing it or helping it in the case of some positive checkpoints uh, to, to do a better job of what it's doing anyway. And so how do we get here? I got here again, as was mentioned earlier, and I'd like to point this out, by just fundamental research on trying to understand how T cells work. Just basic science. Without basic science, we're not going to have anything to translate pretty soon. And so I would um, urge uh, us to really keep that in mind as uh, we funding decisions are made uh, by the NIH and others. So this looks complicated, but it's really not that complicated. Uh, when when uh, the T cell antigen um, was discovered. We worked out the structure of that in 1982. Uh, it was thought that that was single, single, that si signal, single signal was enough to get T cells activated, but quickly it became apparent that that wasn't correct, that there were other signals, co-stimulatory signals, that could only be provided by very specialized cells, uh, dendritic cells, for which Ralph Steinman won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Uh, and when T cells got um, contemporaneous antigen receptor signals and co-stimulatory signals, T cells take, take off. Anyway, we showed in about 1988, um, Jane Gross and, and Fiona Harding in the lab showed that uh, the main receptor for co-stimulatory signals on T cells was CD28, which is constitutively expressed. And when a T cell gets both those, two things happen. One, the first one is that a go program is launched with all that green stuff happening. The T cells go to cell cycle and, and just literally take off because you need to, if you're going to fight a virus infection, go from a few dozen cells perhaps to hundreds of thousands in a matter of a few days. And so this is a really an amazing, uh, for, for a while, uh, T cells are dividing about every four to six hours. But um, in the mid 90s, we discovered, along with Jeff Bluestone, who's now at UCSF, that that an off program is also initiated when the T cell gets those two signals. What happens is a gene of a molecule that's very homologous to CD28 called CTLA4 gets induced. With time, CTLA4 accumulates in the cell and it has the ability to outcompete because of its avidity for the, exactly the same ligands that CD28 uses, can stop co stimulation and end an immune response. This is important because you have to stop that proliferative phase, your immune system will kill you 
we, uh, and, and other labs, knocked out the gene for CD, CKLA4 and the mice die when they're about three weeks old uh, from lymphoproliferation. And so what does that have to do with cancer? Well, we shared early on that solid tumors don't have the co-stimulatory ligand, so they're invisible to the immune system. They grow and grow and grow. Um, and then at some point, the only way the immune system, because they don't have those co-stimulatory signals, they're visible to the immune system until they die, cause inflammation. These phagocytic cells come in, pick in the tumor bits, display, pick up the tumor bits, and display them to, in the context of the co-stimulatory signals. And then you get, by this cross-priming, an immune response started. That also turns on the off signal. And the idea that we had in the, about 1994 was if the off signal gets turned on before you kill all the tumor cells, the tumor wins the race because it has an inherent head start. So we had the idea that you just block CKLA4 and tumors could get rejected. And this is one of the first mouse experiments that we did that shows that just covering up that single molecule is enough to get the tumor rejected and give you permanent immunity. Uh, so we teamed up with Metarex and subsequently bristol myers Squibb to make this ipilimumab. It's a fully human antibody to CKLA4. There have been over 70,000 patients treated with this. Uh, objective responses in many types of cancer, as we would have predicted in the original formulation of the idea. There are adverse events, colitis, hepatitis, a lot of itises, uh, but they're inflammatory, just inflammatory conditions generally and can be handled with steroids and they don't come back. This actually is one of our favorite slides. This is a woman named Sharon, lived in Santa Monica, California, played a lot of tennis, was out in the sun, got melanoma, and you can see the metastases in her lungs. In 2001, she was on the phase one trial. Uh, she got a single dose of three mg per kg of anacetyl-A4, and her, within about six months, her tumors went away. She told uh, Tony Rebus, her doctor, she just wanted to live long enough to see her sons graduate from high school. I visited in 2011, and that was her CAT scan in 2011, 10 years later, with no, no treatment in between, just that one injection. She's still doing fine today. She's almost 16 years out now. She's probably the oldest survivor on ipilimumab. Um, so anyway, it was approved by the FDA in 2011. This is a retrospective study of almost 5,000 patients. It was done a couple of years ago, and it shows about three years there's an inflection point, and it stays flat for 10 years, so about, at about 22%, the survival curve flattens out, and these patients are, are still alive. Nobody dies after about three years or so, and patients, you know, a fraction of them are alive again for 10 years. But why not more? Why is it just 20%? Well, there's a number of reasons for that that it could be, but one obvious one is maybe there are other checkpoints. And so, just as the, uh, the clinical data started coming in on CTLA-4, um, a group at Harvard working with Tosku Hanjo in Japan showed that PD-1, which is a molecule that really had no known function, a clear function until then, was shown to be another uh, inhibitory molecule. Uh, it, like CKLA-4, it has two ligands on APCs. We don't know exactly what those do yet. But unlike CKLA-4, one of its ligands, pd one can be induced on tumor cells by tumor-specific T cells that are making gamma interferon. The tumor puts up the pd one to engage the PD-1 molecule and stop the that. It stops the function. Uh, of the T cells. And so antibodies to PD-1 and PD-L1 were developed. This is the first PD-1 antibody uh, phase one trial in 2012. And you can see in melanoma, again, there was about a, there was a 20%, almost 30% response rate. Non-small cell lung cancer, very significant. Renal cell cancer, uh, again, very good response rate. Uh, none in colorectal cancer in this trial. Uh, but since then, it's been found that there is a subset of colorectal cancer with a high mutational rate that has microsatellite instability, and those do respond. And castrate-resistant prostate cancer also didn't respond, and, and uh, I don't have time to talk about it, but I think we've, we've figured that out, uh, my colleagues at MD Anderson. Anyway, here's a survival curve for PD-1. It's not clear that there's a tail on it because it just hasn't been around enough, but it looks like there, there probably is. Um, and at least some patients have very durable responses. So where do you go? You've got these two things that both work on a fraction of patients. And uh, because they have different mechanisms, the PD-1 works at the level of the T-cell antigen receptor. Uh, we did some mouse studies and showed that the combination of PD-1 and, and CKLA-4 was better than either alone. And so, uh, what happened here? Well, that slide got, somehow got deleted. But anyway, the combination results in responses in about two-thirds of patients who get both the antibodies. Um, there was a, a, a phase three trial a couple of years ago where there was a 50% objective response rate, but 60% of the patients we know now are alive two years later. And so it may be that those patients, if they make it to, to the 
much further, we'll, we'll you know, have a decade-long response rate. And so where we are now is we really need to know the mechanisms of these. What we're finding is the clinical data is coming in so fast, it's overtaken the, the, the science. We know that those little cartoons I showed you are really not all that correct when, once we dive deeply into what's going on in the tumor after you give these antibodies. Uh, it would be really great to have predictive prognostic or pharmacodynamic markers. You're going to hear about that from one of the speakers today. Um, targeting new molecules to improve efficacy. Um, there's a molecule ICOS that was identified by Pam Sharma uh, to play a role in tumor immunity. You're going to hear about it from uh, Debbie later. Um, and also, we need to know how these things work so we can combine the best standard of care therapies. Now, we've got these two, but they're really different. Um, as I said, CTLA-4 is hardwired. PD-1 is induced resistance. CTLA-4 targets co-stimulation. PD-1, the T-cell antigen receptor. CTLA-4 works during priming. PD-1 works on exhausted T-cells that just lose function. Uh, CTLA-4 blockade can expand clonal diversity. That is, bring new T-cells into the, the mix. PD-1 expands the T-cells that are already there. CTLA-4 primarily works on CD-4 cells, we know now. Uh, PD-1 primarily works on CD-8 cells. CTLA-4 can move T-cells into some tumors, uh, prostate cancer notably. Uh, PD-1 does not appear to be able to do that. And one of the big differences is re disease recurrence after response is really low uh, with CTLA-4 and typically focal in nature, uh, whereas uh, the, the uh, relapse after responses with PD-1 is significant. It's about 25% in melanoma and about 35% in lung cancer. And so um, anyway, the, the, that difference is a little worrisome, but the rest of them really explain why these two things work so well together. Um, and as new molecules come, we've got to uh, figure out, you know, how they work. This is kind of where we are. This is a char chart really showing the, the range of, uh, of uh, mutational burden in a variety of types of tumor cells. What's obvious is that the high end, those that have high mutational burden, um, the box, all of those have been approved for monotherapy or combination therapy. Uh, kidney, is, as a lower burden, sort of stands out amongst those with moderate levels of mutational load. Um, but uh, there's others like uh, uh, pancreatic cancer and glioblastoma that we need to really get working on. Um, there's also problems of getting T cells into tumors that, that are, are immunological desert, so we can then worry about the checkpoints. Uh, but we know how to do it. There are a lot more molecules to work on. They're constantly being discovered. I'm sure you'll hear a lot more at this meeting. And I'll just close by saying this is where we were, have been in cancer for a long time, therapy. That's treating a lot of patients with a drug and then statistically determining if we move the median survival. With CTLA-4, we know we can do that, but we can also get a flat survival tail uh, of, a, of a fraction of patients between 20 and 30%. And this is an aspirational goal, but as I said, we know with the combination of PD-1 and CTLA-4, we can get about 50%. Our goal now is to move that tail up. Not so much to worry, in my opinion, about, about moving the median over, but to raise the tail as high as we can get it, and as many cancers as we can. And the, the good news is I think that we know the basics. There's a lot more work to do, but I, I think we, we can get there, at least to a degree, and cure certain kinds of cancer. So thank you for your patience.